morning. Thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me okay? Cool. Cool. All right. So welcome to day two. Uh, more importantly, welcome to the Division of Filing section of the conference. Um, my name is Rosie Chandra, and I, along with Ankit Gorasera, will be presenting on do's and don'ts when it comes to filing review. As a discussion overview, a majority of our presentation will be on common deficiencies that we come across in our filing review. I will be going over some of the administrative deficiencies in Module 1, along with a couple clinical and um, manufacturing items in Modules 2 and 3. Ankit will then take over and discuss a few CMC deficiencies, and then he'll continue with a few best practices, communications, and a res resources for you. All right. No problem. Oh. All right. I think I'm got it. Wait, let me check. Yeah. All right. So let's jump right in. Form FDA 356H. There's two sections of this form that you will usually come across deficiencies. The first section is in field 20. Ensure this is consistent with the patent certifications that you provide in module 1352. If you have multiple patent certifications, make sure you select all that apply. The other section that we see deficiencies is in field 29. This is the establishment section of the form. List all facilities for the drug substance and the drug product along with a contact person at the facility. I do want to emphasize that that contact per person should be at the facility and not a US agent or an administrative contact. Um, for any testing facilities, provide the type of testing that was conducted. And all of the information in field 29 should correspond with all the establishments that you provide in the manufacturing sections in 32S and 32P. With regard to the cover letter, there isn't any particular required information that um, should be in the cover letter. We refer you to the suggested cover letter template found in Appendix B in the draft guidance listed here. Um, applicants are always, always welcome to provide any pertinent information related to their A and DA in the cover letter. We do look over it, read it, look over that. Right. A statement of right of reference should be provided for each and every DMF reference in the application. Two big things about these documents. First is make sure that that statement of reference gives the applicant the right to use that DMF in the application. And two, that that DMF allows the FDA to review that information. Oftentimes, this document is misplaced. It should be located in module 142. In section 112.11, provide the basis of submission, um, whichever reference list, listed drug or RLD that you provide, um, which serves as your basis of submission as well as the reference standard, if different. Um, yesterday, a great presentation was given by Merrill and Martha, I believe, on um, RLDs and the, the recently issued draft guidance um, referencing approved drug products and ANDA submissions, which serves as a great resource. So those are most of the administrative um, common deficiencies that we come across. I'll now be jumping into a few clinical items in Module 2. Um, a big thing in Module 2.7, make sure you provide clinical summary tables for both pilot and pivotal studies. And if PK studies were performed, Table 10 usually has two common deficiencies that we see. The first is provide the location of the LTSS data and a hyperlink to the information. Take a moment, make sure that hyperlink works, make sure it directs us to the appropriate information. Two is provide the data for all analytes that are identified in the product-specific guidance. To continue with clinical summary tables, ensure that the correct clinical summary tables are provided for your respective study. For example, if you request a biopharmaceutics classification system waiver or a BCS waiver, make sure you provide BCS tables. Um, similarly, if you do clinical endpoint studies, make sure you provide those appropriate tables. One more point on this is whenever you cross-reference studies submitted in another ANDA, make sure you still provide all clinical summary tables to support um, the bioequivalence of your proposed drug product to the RLD. In Module 5.2, the tabular listing of studies, 
Um, this is similar to the clinical summary tables in which all studies should be listed for the pilot and pivotal studies. So one other section in Module 3 where we come across a couple common deficiencies is the batch records. Provide all blank manufacturing and packaging records. These include uh, common blends, uh, records for all drug strengths drug strength that are proposed, and the packaging records for all proposed packaging configurations. The second thing about the batch records is in your commercial batch size, do identify the batch size that you're proposing. Oftentimes, that's left out of the blank manufacturing commercial records. And then lastly, ensure that your batch records are fully and completely translated to English. Um, not just the blank records, but also the executed batch records. Make sure any handwritten notes, any measurements, chromatograms, anything on there that is questionably needs to be translated, just go ahead and translate it. Um, Ankit will actually touch on that a little bit more, and I will pass it off to him. So I know I rushed through that, but feel free to like shoot any questions over, um, and we'll touch on that later in the Q&A panel. Thank you, Rosie, for uh, discussing some of the deficiencies we see in modules one and two. And now I'll be continuing the discussion to talk a little bit more about the deficiencies we see in module three. So. First, uh, let's discuss the newly posted impurities tables. Uh, the revised impurities tables were posted in August 2016, along with the final version of the lack of justification of impurities guidance. Uh, please note that the new tables are posted on the FDA webpage. You can also access them by clicking on the link there. Uh, but they are not reflected in the currently posted ANDA filing checklist. For the justification of specification tables, they should be provided in 32S45 or 32P56 for the drug product or the drug substance. And for both the drug product and the drug substance, you should provide a separate table for specified identified, specified unidentified, or unspecified impurity or degradation product. In addition, you should ensure that the necessary tables are fully completed. We commonly see where, uh, in the ANDA that tables state that a certain section is not applicable. If you state as such, do provide a reason for why it may not be applicable. Again, if your product qualifies for an exemption from the tables, as stated in the guidance, do provide the reason for the exemption within these sections as well. The next common deficiency we see is Related to, the CM, related to the CMC section is with API lot numbers. During the filing review, we noticed that the lot numbers are not consistent amongst the sample statement, the stability data sheets, the executed batch records, or sometimes even the certificate of analysis that you've provided. If the API lot numbers within your application are inconsistent, we will issue a filing deficiency to clarify. Therefore, prior to your submission, ensure that the API lot numbers are consistent throughout your application and match. Additionally, you should use at least two API lots to manufacture each strength of the drug product. If you have any questions about your proposed manufacturing approach in regards to the two APIs, you do have the option of submitting a controlled correspondence prior to submission of your ANDA to get agency's feedback. The next deficiency we see related to the CMC section is with the stability data. In module 32P83, you should clearly indicate the initiation date as well as the corresponding sample pull date for each stability study that you've conducted to support your application. The initiation dates as well as these pull dates should be reflected on the stability data sheets itself. The common issue we see during the filing review is that the dates on the stability data sheets do not match the dates that have been provided in a separate table elsewhere in the application. So therefore, if the dates don't match, we will issue a filing deficiency to clarify. So again, prior to submitting your application, you want to ensure that all the dates are accurate and consistent within the stability section as well as any other tables that you've provided. Secondly, you should ensure that all stability data contains three time points 
covering a minimum of 180 days for both the accelerated and long-term studies. During the filing review, we do verify that the stability study has met the 180-day old time recommendation. So let's say you've begun your accelerated studies and you start seeing failure at the, before the 180th day, right? In this case, do not stop your accelerated studies. If the accelerated study begins to fail within the 180th day, submit the full failing accelerated data along with a failure analysis. Additionally, you should also submit any appropriate intermediate studies, if applicable. We commonly see applicants stopping the accelerated studies and do not provide the full complement of failed data. This will actually result in a refuse to receive. For those products for which worst case and non-worst case orientation is applicable, do provide data that meets the minimum time point requirement and the whole time requirement recommendation in both orientations. The next filing deficiency we see is related to the reconciliation tables in module 3.2R. So in 3.2R, do provide a reconciliation summary table to include the theoretical yield, the actual yield, and the packaged yield for all of your executed batches. If your yields are calculated as percentages, please do express these yields in the number of units as well. I do want to emphasize that this applies for all dosage forms, including injectable and topical drug products. So those are some of the common deficiencies we see during the, during the filing review. In addition to the deficiencies we discussed today, we wanted to provide some best tips and practices to help you compile your application. So number one, make sure that the ANDA is translated to English. We see this issue throughout the application, but most notably in the more technical areas of Module 3. You're advised to double check all documents, including those submitted from DMF holders or maybe some contractors, to ensure that they are fully and completely translated. As you can imagine, untranslated or poorly translated documents makes the ANDA more difficult to review. Number two. You are advised to read and follow all ECTD and PDF specification guidances. As you may already know, um, I do want to point out that as of May 5th, 2017, so exactly a month from today, all ANDAs must be submitted in proper ECTD format. If the application is submitted in ECTD format, not only will it save you time from fixing the issues we identify at during the filing review, but it will also facilitate the review, the technical review of your application as well. And lastly, we want to ensure that you submit a substantially complete ANDA that avoids an RTR, right? So always remember to double check your submission for completeness. Make sure you check everything, including any translations, any uh, documents for legibility. Uh, we commonly see legibility issues in uh, any graphs, chromatograms, IR spectra that you've submitted. So you want to make sure that those are all translated, legible, and sub submitted appropriately and linked in the backbone as well. So those are some of the best practices that we, we wanted to share. Uh, but if you have any questions, and if your question is related specifically to an ANDA or status of an ANDA, uh, you should, while it's in filing, I want to mention, you can contact the ANDA filing mailbox. In addition, for suitability petitions, if you'd like to know the status of a uh, suitability petition, you can also contact the ANDA filing mailbox. If you have more general questions related to, uh, not related to a specific application, you should contact the generic drugs mailbox. So these are some resources to help you compile your application. And lastly, um, so Rosie and I have discussed some of the filing deficiencies we see during the filing review. We've also talked a little bit about best practices and you know, some, provided some resources for you. Uh, if you have any questions, we, we will be back along with Julia at the 11 a.m. Uh, panel discussion, um, and we look forward to answering them. Thank you.